Hi, I'm Becky Mayer and welcome to Transitions Mind, Body, Spirit. Transitions, we all have so many transitions in our life and I like to use the metaphor of a triathlon, something that I did three of this past summer. And then triathlons, what do you do? The first thing you do is you swim and then you get into the transition area and then you get on your bicycle. And then you get on the transition area again and run. So that's a great metaphor. We have so many different things that we start out in our life, uh, maybe a kid, we have different ideas, and then it changes from one to another, and then you go, whoa, I hadn't planned on this, but this is great, or it isn't. Um, so we've done a first show on our guests, but this is a second show. Uh, and our guest today is Lee McCormick. Welcome, Lee McCormick. Well, thank you. It's great to be here, <laughs> to still be here. <laughs> to still be here, yeah. yes. And then uh, the whole show that we just did, where I could barely squeeze in all the wonderful things that Lee has done, but basically uh, he has was raised in Florida and also part of Wyoming, was a cowboy, a cattle rancher, a musician, played in bands, got him to Nashville, and uh, needed um, what addiction came in his life, and he went to Sierra Tucson, a very famous place, and came back and started his own wellness center, and uh, right in the Nashville area, which is called The Ranch. And we're gonna start from there uh, and uh, go on for the, the our next part of the show. Cool. Yes. Yeah. So here you are. You created the ranch and give us the nutshell idea what was or still is. You've sold it, but you created it. What was it different? How was it different? Why were you inspired to start it outside Nashville? Um, well, the inspiration really came out of my experience at Sierra Tucson. Sierra Tucson, at that time, it's, it's a different facility today than it was in, in the 90s. Um, but uh, it's out in the desert, right? It's in the Sonoran Desert there outside of Tucson. And I spent a lot of time walking in the desert. They had trails mm. that ran around, a 12-step trail and some other trails. Mm. Um, and the time out in that desert was so important to me because it's it's where you could hear yourself. It's where God mm -hmm. could talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, so I realized that it's really important if you're going to create a healing environment to have a balance between directed groups and, and therapeutic modalities mm -hmm. and all of the structure and experiences that most people think of as being um, addiction treatment or mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. And to have a balance between that structure and a relationship with life. Mm. And, you know, life is this great fabric. It is the natural world. It's the sky and the wind and the mm. earth. Um, and it's, and we're an aspect of this fabric of life. Uh, part of our issue, I believe, is the human issue, is that we've really fallen under our own spell in that we believe our story of life is the truth rather than us, our story of life is just a story mm -hmm. that we've made up. Um, and we, we get out of balance because of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we live for the human matrix world. It's what I call it. The Matrix movie is one of the greatest films ever <laughs> made to me. But we live so dedicated and loyal to the world that we were domesticated to live in as children, mm -hmm. that we abandon all the mystical aspects of ourselves. We abandon our relationships to, to creation. So in that respect, <clears throat> so there you are starting the ranch. How was it different and what did you add that the other place didn't have? Well, it was on a working cattle ranch. And so, um, People were, we were outside a lot. I mm. built a big medicine wheel. Um, I had the first male client we ever had at the ranch was a Native American guy from Southern Arizona. Wow. Um, that came through a connection that I made when I was at Sierra Tucson. And he asked if he could build a sweat lodge. 
Um, he was a Native American church member. And I said, sure. So we went down to the river and built a sweat lodge. And I'd never done a sweat before. Wow. Yeah. But, um, and that experience was so profound for me that it's, it's like, of course, this, this, this ceremony has to be a part of this healing process mm -hmm. because one of the greatest aspects of the lodge is that it cleans us on every level. It cleans us energetically. Mm -hmm. It cleans us physically. It, it cleans our whole energy field. Mm. Um, and it brings us, it helps to bring us back toward balance again. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the, the medicine wheel came out of that, those same relationships. And say what a medicine wheel is. It's a, the medicine wheels I've built, um, it's, they're big circles of stones. Mm -hmm. Um, the majority of the wheels I've built, the, the layout was dreamed by a man named Sunbear mm. back in the 60s. Mm. Um, he was a Muskogee guy from Oklahoma. And he dreamed this wheel and the spirit people told him in the dream what each of the stones represented as far as the universe or the mm. animal kingdom or the, the fabric of life was concerned. Um, and I, I, I love Sunbear's interpretation of the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've followed that, I've used that. Mm -hmm. So I build these big stone circles. Um, they can be, you know, 20 feet across, they could be 100 feet across. Mm -hmm. So it just, it, it's determined by, by what your use is gonna be and what your inspiration is. And you walk it like a labyrinth? What do you do with it? No, you, you enter it the way I work with the wheel. A wheel is a, it's a, it's a place of reflection um, it's also what I call an in-between-the-worlds place. Mm -hmm. Going in the sweat lodge is an in-between-the-worlds place. Mm -hmm. You're in between the realm of energy and spirit and this realm of form that we live in. Mm -hmm. um, the physical, there's the physical manifestation world, and then there's the realm of spirit and energy that is the source of the formation of the physical world. Mm -hmm. So spirit and forms form. Um, and the medicine wheel can be a space in between those two where you can have the experience, you can have all kinds of experiences mm -hmm. and I've had all kinds of experiences happen with people. Mm -hmm. That's a cool thing about it is each individual is going to have their own unique experience. I don't okay. teach, I don't teach that it means this and it means that. Uh -huh. That robs people of the opportunity of their own innate wisdom and their own innate spirit talking to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you give them guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the mind, our mind needs a little guidance when you're going into something you've never done before, mm -hmm. you don't know anything about. Um, so you give them some guidance and you, you, you direct it to a degree and then you shut up and leave them alone. Okay. And let them live their own experience there. So when someone would visit the ranch for, would it be for like cocaine or sex addiction or food addiction or what, what and you know, how long would they be there? It, they were there because they're, they were suffering. So I, I always used to say, we treat human beings, not diseases. Okay. And if you're going to treat and work with the whole human being, then you're going to, you're going to have to address those issues of those patterns of behavior that become addictions. Mm -hmm. Addiction is not a disease to me. It's a pattern, it's an energetic pattern of behavior mm -hmm. that manifests physically, it manifests um, psychologically, it manifests emotionally, and it's just energy. Mm -hmm. As if everything is energy, well, an addictive pattern is just energy. You okay. know, and yet our, our culture tends to want to qualify everything based on science and based on knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we want to define it all. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's, it's a disease and it's this and it's that as though it's just locked down and that's, that's it matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And I never found that to be true. Well, people would come to the ranch and like stay for a month or oh, stay? Oh, they would stay two, three, four, five months. It was an extended care program at oh, that time. Okay. So they, have, they were coming at, wow. in the beginning clients were coming out of residential treatment programs mm -hmm. and they would come to the ranch to really reconfigure their relationship with themselves and the world. You know, a, a residential treatment experience is really intense 
and it's really short, even at 30 or 60 days, it's very short because you're unraveling your whole lifetime, mm -hmm. hopefully. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you're in a program that helps you start unraveling your, your whole life experience. Mm -hmm. um, and the ranch really served in that way. I raised quarter horses, so we had horses there. So the, the people could like care for the horses? or the... Yeah, we did equine therapy, we did trail rides. Um, Piney wow. River flowed through the property, so we would do kayak trips and canoe trips. Wow, there's you outdoor know, opportunities and being well, we, with nature. I, I believe the way, the way to heal your life is through how you're going to live your life. Mm -hmm. It's not thinking about it and talking about it. It's ah, doing it. I, I, I totally agree with you, yeah. You know, and, yeah. and that would inspire people. Like the, you get on the river and you float the river and you... you you know, you may turn over, you may get scared or get stuck in a, against a tree or something, but you deal with it and then you, you can talk about it after the fact and help people realize that even when you were terrified in that moment, you're still here. You responded, mm -hmm. you know, um, or somebody came to help you, which is a big deal for most of us in our life. Asking for help is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a huge accomplishment, mm -hmm. you know, because we're we're really domesticated to believe that we should be able to handle it all by ourselves, especially mm. men. Women right. are much better about asking each other for help or connecting to one another than men are traditionally. Mm -hmm. Wow, so there you are at the, um, at the ranch and it was extremely successful. I mean, I kept on hearing about the ranch, the ranch, uh, and then you sold it. Well, I sold it after 12 years. Okay. Um, yeah, and that was, at that place in time, that was, that's what I needed to do. Yeah, it just was the right time to, yeah, to change. You, well, you talk about transitions. For me in my life, um, it was a transition point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you also, at the same time, was developing a wellness center in Nashville, not in the country, in Nashville, I thought with the idea of people who have been at the ranch, well, can they go someplace in a town, a city area yeah. to continue their work? Well, the, to come back into the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, the ranch had evolved from being an extended care program into being a residential treatment program okay. because of the level of acuity kept going up. You know, we're, we're getting more complicated and less healthy in this country. We're not getting better for the most part. And so as the levels of acuity kept going up, in order to address that, we needed to, to raise the bar on the, the quality and the structure of the treatment program. Mm -hmm. So it became a residential treatment center. And okay. then as a residential treatment center, I wanted to recreate in Nashville at Integrative Life what the ranch, a version of what the ranch had been as extended care, because mm -hmm. it, there are transitions that you go through on this journey of, of self-discovery and healing and recovery. Mm -hmm. And then you also, uh, the, another part of this is that you were doing things in California. You met a woman, she became your wife, and you started a center in California, but also, uh, the Four Agreements, you read that book, you became uh, interested in the, uh, the author, I guess you met the author of that and started to go to Mexico, is that where it all started? Yeah, I, when I read The Four Agreements, it had such a, such a powerful impact on me. Mm -hmm. um, it was like Miguel was sitting there talking to me, Miguel Ruiz, the man that, that wrote it. Um, and I was so drawn to the energy of that book and the points of view of life in that book that I sought him out. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I found teachers in California that had been trained by Miguel and had worked with him for years. Mm -hmm. And I went on a journey to Teotihuacan with them. And just, tell people what Teotihuacan is. Teotihuacan, <laughs> um, it's, it translates in one form it, it's said to translate to the place where man becomes God. I, I don't, you get a lot of strange translations, right? Translations mm -hmm. are only as good as the understanding of the one doing the translation. 
um, to me, Teo is the place where we wake up to God. It's like, to me, it was pyramid and pyramids and pyramids uh, built uh, the, by the Toltecs that was before Christ. Is that no, what they think? The, they were built about 1,000, 1,200 years ago. Oh, okay. But it had been a healing area. There, there are a series of caves underneath Teo. Mm -hmm. All around Teotihuacan underground are, are these amazing caves. And those caves have been places of healing for thousands of years. Ah. So it's the energy that emerges through those caves from the inner world of the earth. Mm -hmm. There's an energy that we call black light. And that energy emerges into the caves and that the, the shaman, the healers from the old days, from, you know, 1,000, 15, 2,000 years ago, mm -hmm. they worked with that energy. It's literally mm -hmm. interpreted as the energy that form is manifest of. Mm -hmm. So okay. black light is, um, it's unique and it's, you really feel it. If, you're, if, if who you go to Teotihuacan with on a journey is in a deep relationship with that place, then they can guide you into areas and experiences where you'll realize the presence of that black light. It's profound in our physical body. You can feel it. I felt a little bit of that, and I was led into different parts of the pyramid on a personal basis, but uh, it wasn't as profound as what you're saying, but I don't know, maybe... Uh, well, I've lived a journey. I've, I've lived a relationship with Teotihuacan for 25 years, uh -huh. and I, you know, I literally have a home there. So, I, I, and I view my relationship with it. It is a relationship. It's like a relationship with a friend or a, hmm. a, a horse or, hmm. or you. Um, it's a living relationship. So it's continuously moving and evolving and changing. Mm -hmm. And Teotihuacan speaks to you. It, it'll show you things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's as a, I guess in normal lingo, you would just say it's a holy place because it's a place where things you can't explain happen all the time. And through that relationship is how I guide people. Mm -hmm. I know I was with Andrew Critchell's that I did a show on and he said things were kept moving, uh, objects moving in his, in his, uh, in the, 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 the dreaming house, you go, my sunglasses were here, but they disappeared. I mean, he was like, what spirits are out there? Well, those are the little people <laughs> ah. that move stuff around. I had a, a, a Catholic <laughs> priest that went on a journey with me. Yeah. And he had put his shoes, he took his shoes off when he went in his room and he set them right by the door. Well, he woke up the next morning and his shoes were outside, outside his door against the wall. And he was, it just freaked him out. He had no idea how did that happen. <laughs> well, they have a tradition of little people that are called duendes. And the duendes, to me, they're similar to leprechauns, the little people of, mm. of Ireland and the British Isles. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're, they exist in a dimension right next to ours. So they can come into this dimension, mm -hmm. but they don't live here. But they do all kind of stuff. <laughs> so you can believe it, not believe it. Right. When you've had enough experiences with yeah. them, like I hear them running around on the roof of my house all, off and on all the time in Mexico. Oh, they'll wow. be up there running around. Yeah. <laughs> and they love electronics, so they'll turn people's cell phones on in the middle of the night. They'll do stuff like that. Wow. And then you freak out and jump up well, you can't see them because they just pop in and out. Wow. You know, perception is based on the frequencies of light that you're taking in through your eyes. Yes. So they're, they're there, but, wow. and then some people can see them. My wife can see like that. Wow. But. Oh, so you, you're going to be leading people there again this year? Yeah, I don't have a trip set yet, but I will be going back this year. Mm -hmm. And I am going back to Peru um, July 15th to the 27th. And tell us about Peru. How did Peru get in your radar there? Um, again, it was Miguel Ruiz had mm -hmm. a relationship with Peru. Miguel follows, he's always followed the threads of energy mm -hmm. and the threads of light. Um, and Peru is a profoundly powerful deeply, deeply sweet, feminine, energetic. Mm. The Andes to me are just, they're alive. Those mountains are alive. Mm. If, you can, 
if you can quiet yourself, if you literally can just get quiet and completely still when you're in the Andes, they'll talk to you. Wow. You don't need ayahuasca. You don't need San Pedro. Right. Uh, you know, it's because the, the Caros, the native people of the Andes, have never stopped living a direct relationship with creation. They still call the wind and the wind will come. They can talk to the creek and the water slows down. I've been with them when they do these You've things. You've seen this. And at first it's, it's really weird to you, but then it just makes sense because they have a living relationship with the fabric of life and we're an aspect of that fabric of life. Mm. You know, we're, we are light, our spirit is light embodied in a human form. Mm -hmm. And our human body is made up, all the elements of our body came from the earth, mm -hmm. from the mother. Wow. And so you have been doing these um, journeys. You have invited people to be on a journey in the Peru and also in Mexico. Uh, and then just the past year and a half, your health has come up uh, because of the cancer that was found. Right. And I wanted Which you... I discovered, I felt the tumor the first time in Peru on a journey laying on my bed. I just felt something weird there and I, I knew it was something, I, you know. Wow, do you think the spirits were telling you about that? Yeah, it's like... I mean, I, there's, there's no coincidences. So, you know, it was like, pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I did, I came home and called my doctor and had an ultrasound and that saw something and then had a CAT scan and off down the yellow brick road I went. So. Wow, and part of it was going to the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville too. Well, the Mayo Clinic is, is arguably the, the top liver cancer treatment program or place in the world right I now. I did not know that. Yeah, oh. and Jacksonville is where they do that work. And I'm also from Jacksonville Beach. So, right. you know, in a sense, I'm going home. A funny twist to that, is my mom and my stepdad, A.D. Davis, um, were really primary, they were essentially involved in Mayo coming to Jacksonville. And there's pictures oh. of them in the lobby of the Davis building. Oh, your mom and your stepdad. So I walked into wow. that building, it was like, oh my God, my mother, I'm, she's still taking care of me. <laughs> Whoa, indeed. Yeah. Wow. And so, <clears throat> because this has been a precarious thing, uh, Tell me about um, your thoughts on death. Well, I don't believe there, death is, there's really not a death. What there is is the consciousness that we are, the spirit that we are, comes into form in this body when, mm -hmm. when, when we're born, when we're conceived. Um, and we come here and live this experience as human which, you know, I don't know why, why we're here necessarily. I love being here and I've, I've, the experience has been amazing. Um, and when we're done, when we leave our bodies, the, from experiences I've had, when we leave our bodies, we just return to our real home, to where we came from. Do we know where that is? No, not while we're here, we don't. People okay. can believe all kind of things about it, right? And you don't know. Mm -hmm. You don't know for a fact. I, I don't know for a fact. I know how it feels, you know, but I don't have a story about it. But I have. Hmm. It was interesting because when I got diagnosed, I kept waiting to be afraid, and yeah. I've never had fear. Wow. I've never had fear. I had a lot of sadness, you know, at the thought of leaving my wife and my daughters and yes. and the things that I love, but I I never had fear. I'm like I'm really intrigued to get back home again. <laughs> in, <laughs> like what in a is sense. it? Home? But just not right now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. And there's not the the the, the fear of the, the death thing. That's what everybody fears because you don't it's the unknown. Well, it's a homecoming. That's what I've learned in my, ah. my relationship with the angel of death, as we talked about mm -hmm. on the other show. Um, the angel of death comes to take us home again. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it is scary because it's the unknown and our mind can't deal, doesn't deal well with the unknown, mm -hmm. right? So the mind will go into fear. 
Fortunately, I've lived a life that I've learned that I'm not my mind. I have a relationship with my mind, mm. okay? But my mm -hmm. mind doesn't rule my life anymore the way it did for the first 40 years. Ah, Most people's minds wisdom. own their life, rule right. their life. Yes. Right? Well, the mind is an aspect of being human. It's not what we are. It's an aspect of us as human beings, just like emotions are an aspect of being human. Okay. You know, the physical body is an aspect of being human. Consciousness is an aspect of being human. Um, and all those aspects make us these fantastic beings that we are. But I, I just, I never had fear around it. And I've still not had fear. I don't know, I may get scared the day I'm checking out of my body, but I kind of <laughs> don't think so. Wow, that's good to be so prepared. So you have created so many different businesses and now you're still leading people to Peru and, and, uh, and Spirit spiritrecovery.com yeah spiritrecovery.com in case anybody wants to know more um, but what's next oh gosh well i've kind of put the what's next on hold when i got mm -hmm. diagnosed a year ago um, because i wanted all my attention and my energy basically i wanted to to bring bring all myself back back home to me again mm. to be with my family mm. i didn't want to be spread thin anymore cuz i've always gone had 50 things going on and yeah. went a lot of directions. Um, and it was all passionate. It was all of passion, everything I've ever done. I've loved it. But mm -hmm. I wanted to just be with them and be mm -hmm. connected to them and take care of this body, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and take care of, of being responsible for the healing. Um, but that's that's what was that's what's most important. And you feel you're on the other side, and now are you know I'm still on the journey. I'm still on the journey. I don't take anything for granted. It's gone very well. My treatments have gone very well. Yes. I've responded very well, um, and it's it changes you. Um, I'll I'll never take uh, waking up in the morning for granted ah, again right. ever. Right. You know I'll I'll never. I'll never take a, a sunset or a sunrise for granted. I'll, I stop all the time and just look, mm, just watch. To savor it. Just to see life happening. Yes. You know, there's a sweetness that comes with realizing, and the only way you really realize this is you have to be there. It has to happen with you, mm. I think. You have to get a diagnosis that tells you you could be gone in, in a year, or you could be gone in three years or five years or whatever. Um, but there's a sweetness that comes with that because you realize that all we have here are our moments. That's right. And then you, you don't. And what's yes. the quality of the moment? Right. You know, what are you bringing into the moment? Yes. Well, you have brought so many moments in your very, very rich, rich life. And I, 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 on the next part, as you live more, I want you back for the third show. But for now, um, watch the first show and the second show on Lee McCormick and thank you and have a good good evening thank you <laughs> I really want to get your philosophy on you know what's on the other side and what do you do and I don't have a story about it really